in terms of individual well-being, these ancient thinkers are just as relevant now as they ever were because there's still things going on in the world around us that we can't control. And there's things going on in our mind that really haven't changed. Human nature hasn't fundamentally changed and we can control that. So I think learning the path to personal happiness from these ancient thinkers is good. In many ways, the path to collective happiness is uncharted territory. And so we have to figure a lot of this out for ourselves if, if we've got a shot. Hello, Ryan. Thank you so much for doing this. If you can just tell people a little bit about yourself and what brings you here uh, so they can get a little understanding prior to us getting into the conversation and talking about your book or your new book. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Mike. Happy to be here. Um, so, yeah, I'm a designer, author, founder of uh, a book called Designing the Mind and an organization of the same name. Uh, it's my sort of first book. I teach people what I call the principles of psychotecture, the process of sort of designing and changing your mind. And since coming out with that first book, I've uh, brought out a number of physical products and online programs and a, a community. Uh, but I also wrote this new book that's going to be coming out very soon called Become Who You Are. Uh, I think it's my best, uh, best book yet, best thing I've created. So I'm really excited to, to share it with everyone. Right on. Thank you. All right. So yeah, the book Become Who You Are and the, what do they call it? The subtitle, A New Theory of Self-Esteem, Human Greatness and the Opposite of Depression. I guess I, I always sort of, my curiosity wants to ask me, you know, about your life, which you do talk about a little bit in the book. Well, my childhood and adolescent was quite different. Uh, and I, you talk a lot about just this general sense of like insight or desire to learn about life and the the questions of life and uh, <laughs> it's like you were a philosopher from a pretty young age um, right <laughs> yeah so I guess I'm just curious like how and again you do talk about it in the book but how do you how did that all was it just like innately come up did your parents introduce you to these things like how did you just start asking these questions about life and and your place in it yeah yeah, I think it's a combination of things. You know, I do have a couple of very thoughtful parents. My mom homeschooled me and, um, you know, did things a little differently. Um, you know, she's she's a very kind of wisdom oriented person herself. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I may have picked a lot of that up from my parents. I may it may just be a genetic thing, but I've always been very curious about my own mind and, and observing it and its functions and uh, I've always been less interested in the physical world around me. Like anyone who knows me will know my sense of direction, for example, is deplorable. Like I have no <laughs> idea where I am ever because because I, I think I just have this very inward oriented uh, nature. And so um, really from when I was kind of like a early adolescent, I started asking myself a lot of questions about uh, my own mind and also the universe and philosophy and as soon as I, you know, started getting exposed to like Wikipedia and YouTube, I was just digging into every question I could come up with and realizing slowly that there was like a very long history of people asking these kind of questions and it wasn't just me. Um, but <laughs> but uh, yeah, in particular, I was fascinated by my ability to change my own mind, to change my uh, beliefs and habits and even, you know, more notably my emotions. I was learning hmm. when I was in school that I there are things I can do in my mind to change the emotional output of whatever I'm going through so that I can experience a, a better emotion uh, even when I'm going through a negative thing, a setback, something uh, like that. And I was building out this sort of world um, of, of psychological change. And then I started coming across Stoicism and Buddhism and, and all these different philosophies that basically you know, beat me to it by a couple thousand years and have been teaching a lot of these things uh, for a lot longer. And and then, you know, psychology too. I mean, I started just devouring everything I could get my hands on related to how we operate our own minds. So um, naturally very curious about this stuff, but I think uh, probably some of my social struggles actually helped in a sense that I didn't have like that busy of a social life demanding all my time. And I, I was able to like go on long walks and think and, and learn about myself. So, um, but I, I write about all the, the social stuff in the book too. 
Yeah. Yeah. And you can't remember where it is in the book, but you describe this sort of moment where you started challenging yourself to grow, I guess, or whatnot. And this idea, or, or in particular, the decision to join the football team and knowing you per, perhaps weren't going to be a regular play, like starter or whatever you want to call it, but yeah, you still yeah. decided to do it and you stuck it out and all that kind of thing. I'm curious, just again, from a young age to have the insight or just whatever it is that you were having, I think is somewhat unique. And yeah, how did you do that? <laughs> for lack of a better question. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. No, I mean, I think, I think lots of people, you know, play on sports teams, but if you know me, like it's a little bit of an odd fit. I was more of a chess team type of kid. Um, But I, I kind of realized I I went into like real school in seventh grade, which, um, you know, for the record is probably the worst year to (laughs) to stop being homeschooled. Uh, (laughs) But I kind of realized I, I didn't, I wasn't really proud of the person I was. I, I didn't have the social skills. I was kind of afraid of the world. I, I didn't know how to interact with these people. And, and in general, uh, yeah, I just, I just wasn't really the person I wanted to be. I wasn't the person I admired. I don't really know, know how I understood this at that age, but I, I kind of decided I need to get as far out of my comfort zone as I possibly can. And I decided being on the football team was the thing that scared me more than anything else. So I, I went and uh, and did it. And I actually, um, I mean, it, it never stopped really scaring me. Like every game night and even every like probably practice, I was I was still nervous about it. But, um, you know, getting used to being uncomfortable and kind of getting comfortable being com- uncomfortable. It, it was an important process for me at that age because it kind of gave me a reference for like, anything I'm going through that's scary or difficult, it's not really as scary as like a football game or whatever. So, so I can, I can handle it. I can do things that are not super comfortable. I can, you know, start going on podcasts when I came out with my first book, even though that's scary at first too. Like, um, so I think it's important to, uh, to build out that kind of range of possibilities so that you can become more a person that you, you admire. I think this is, really one of the core ideas of the book, if not the core idea, is that this is what the good life is. It's about being someone that you admire through your through your actions every day. Yeah, I think that's a nice, as they say, segue maybe into the book. I, I've spent a lot of time in high schools talking to students. And one of the first things, I only have 60 minutes with them. So it's like, how do I, you know, and for my own sort of, ADHD mind, which, which I found interesting. You sort of brought that into the book too. Um, but to condense all these ideas and try to be as effective as possible. But the point is, uh, I have this slide of, I can't remember, just like an arrow or a line. Mm -hmm. And basically it says pain in the middle and one side of the line is a frowning face and the other side is a smiling face. Uh, and I sort of something describing like the suffering is the gap between or pain suffering i know those things are described differently but is the gap between who you are and who you want to be and for me it's funny i had the opposite trajectory that you did uh (laughs) and and often you know in canada i think drugs are more readily available and there's not as sort of much like i know obviously depends where you are in america but and i sort of went the opposite direction that gap between who you are and who you want to be, as you kind of just brought up is sort of a huge part of the book. And you have these sort of nice in the first part of the book, you have these sort of you have the axis and then you go three dimensional. But do you want to maybe just talk about how you see the essence of the good life and and just how well being virtue, ethics, values all fit together? Yeah, I really like that suffering as the gap between who you are and who you want to be very, very closely related idea. Um, Mm -hmm. And and I have a similar kind of dimensional axis thing. So I'll I'll share that. So kind of if you imagine there's a a chessboard on the table in front of you, Um, you've got the x axis, the kind of left and right, which is pleasure and pain. So further to the right, you're experiencing more pleasure at that point in your life, further to the left, more pain, more suffering, discomfort, right? Uh, You've got the y axis, which is kind of moving 
further away from you or closer to you on the chessboard. And this represents loss and gain. So further up means you've got more success, more external gain in your life. And moving down means you're experiencing some kind of loss. And so what I argue is that most of us as adults basically use this chessboard as a map for navigating our lives. Sometimes, you know, we'll take some pleasure in the moment. Sometimes we'll sacrifice the pleasure and, uh, you know, make, uh, make compromises in order to achieve more long-term gain. And so we're always kind of balancing these two. The problem is it's not really a very good map in the sense that, you know, if you were, if you were using this map to navigate uh, some terrain, you'd find yourself stumbling and falling off cliffs all the time. And, uh, and you wouldn't really understand why. Well, you've got a bad map. And, and basically, uh, you know, we've got a lot of data suggesting that this is not really how happiness works, right? We don't really mm -hmm. feel more deeply fulfilled in our lives just because we're experiencing pleasure or gain at that moment, external success. Lots of stories of people who have everything on paper and they're still unhappy. Um, you know, lottery winners, paraplegics, people who have lost seemingly everything in their life is ruined and very quickly they adapt and they're like, oh, okay, this is just as good as before. It's different, but, you know, it's all good. Um, but but the idea, I think, you know, not just that we can't predict our happiness, it's not just that happiness never changes and we always stay at a set point, because this this isn't true. We we Our happiness does change over time. There are some periods of life where we'll be deeply fulfilled, even if it doesn't really make sense on paper, and others will, where, where, others where we'll be, uh, you know, just kind of uh, lost and, and disoriented and despairing, even though um, everything seems good. And so uh, what I what I sort of do is extrude a third dimension out of this chessboard. So if you imagine now a, a three-dimensional topography of mountains and valleys on this chessboard, what I argue is that there is this third dimension, the Z-axis, that's really pulling the strings of our happiness. So even when we're moving to the right and we're saying, oh, I'm, I'm getting happier because I'm gaining something, well, really, you're getting happy if you're if you're climbing higher up these mountains uh, and, and you just don't have a map for really seeing those mountains. So you don't really understand what's going on under the surface. So this third dimension, uh, I introduce it initially as admirability. And it's basically this idea that you are as happy as your own actions that you admire, right? When you your brain observes you doing things that you would approve of if another pe person was doing them. Right. That is what actually increases your well-being. And you get unhappy when your brain is unable to find evidence for those things that you admire. Right. I use the term virtue for these traits. It's a very old uh, term with a really rich philosophical history, but it's also become kind of a stuffy, preachy kind of word today, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but but I say in the book, you know, when you think about virtue, don't think about colorless mandates. Think about the colors of exotic birds, because essentially anything that you are good at, your greatest strengths, whether that's charisma or courage or creativity or compassion, these are the virtues that you are demonstrating to yourself that you possess through your actions. And this is what's really uh, creating well-being under the surface. Yeah, great. Okay, that that's like a, a jumping off point for sort of later in the book um, that I want to, I'm going to try to resist the impulse to ask you about that uh, and go back a little bit to the beginning of, of so one thing I, I really just generally admired so much about the book is, well, one, you all, you describe, I'd say 75% of my therapy practice, like as a therapist, <laughs> about mm. uh, so much of the stuff I do with people is very much analogous to a lot of the things you put in the book. And you did such a good job at blending in sort of the, I guess, the research or the academics, the ancient philosophy, modern life experiences. Yeah. Anyway, it was just a comment on how, how nicely you <laughs> oh, did I, all that and how hard that is to, to, to like put all of that together. I appreciate <sighs> that. It, yeah. it is. Uh, I mean, this is kind of how my brain works. I don't, I don't really bring new research to the table. There's no new experimental data, but I am pretty good at looking at seven different fields and saying, how do these all weave together? And this yeah. is something I think we don't generally do enough of. So I, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, you really did a great job. Okay, so on that note, 
a lot of the references or the research that you cite, I'm relatively familiar with. So I just wanted to ask you a little bit about that. Um, in the beginning, you, you reference Paul Bloom's work on the sweet spot. And as I understand it, it's the voluntary suffering that leads to a sense of well-being or fulfillment or purpose. And I guess I'm just kind of curious how you think about that idea of suffering and well-being and meaning and purpose and how that fits into this idea of admirable action. And if you want to sort of reframe that question or if I'm getting it right, um, please, please do that. No, that that's great. It's a little bit of a different conceptualization than the one I introduce in this book, because Paul Bloom mm -hmm. says that, like, basically suffering is necessary to create meaning and happiness, and you need a certain amount of pain and discomfort uh, right. in order to feel deeply satisfied in your life. Um, what I argue in the book is that basically um, suffering is sort of orthogonal. It's It's a different dimension from this deeper well-being. And so there are times when suffering, experiencing more pain or loss will move you higher up those mountains of virtue, right? Mm -hmm. So there are people, you know, uh, Viktor Frankl writes about how finding meaning in, in a concentration camp, right? Uh, so certainly you can suffer and still say like, this, this is beside the point to the, the greatest, uh, deepest kind of well-being that we want the most. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also not necessary, in my view, to suffer in order to produce that well-being, right? I've had, I mean, I say in the book, like writing this book, particularly the second one, was almost completely devoid of pain and suffering. Uh, you know, I, I think at this point, I've learned how to like not beat myself up too much about my work as I'm writing it and just kind of close it and say, yeah, it'll get better over time. Uh, my first book, I was a little harder on myself. This one, it came together pretty smoothly. It was incredibly rewarding for me and satisfying and, mm. you know, some would say meaningful. But <laughs> um, but yeah, I wasn't really suffering over it, right? It was a pleasant experience. And so I think there, the, the real idea is that there are times when suffering will be required, when discomfort will be required to move us up higher on that Z-axis. There'll be other times when the best way to move up the Z-axis is to move to the right on this you know, uh, this chessboard and experience more gain and pleasure. And so really learning to see what's beside the point and what is only a means to the end of well-being as opposed to the end in itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And can you kind of just define your understanding and me? And I'm, I'm, this is really for my own <laughs> clarity. <laughs> like, how do you think about virtue, ethics and values and maybe uh, how you understand the um, ancient philosophies and sort of modern psychological science, I guess, like, and how they define those things. Yeah, great question. Ethics is, uh, it's taken on a bit of a different meaning today than it had a couple thousand years ago by the first people who are really talking about it. Today, ethics is what you should do, what you ought to do, even if, you know, it's not good for you, even if it's, you know, you have to sacrifice yourself and your own happiness for it, it's the right thing to do. Um, back in the day, ethics was deeply tied to happiness. It was what you should do, but not just for everyone else uh, at your own expense. It's what you should do for you. It's the wise decision that will bring the deepest long-term happiness. And so they had this term eudaimonia, which is kind of the, the ultimate peak kind of happiness. And it's the happiness of being a person that you approve of yourself. Uh, and that mm -hmm. means acting in a way that you approve of, that you admire. And that's where happiness and virtue initially became so closely linked. This has kind of become forgotten, I think, but initially mm -hmm. it was understood mm -hmm. by all of these Greek philosophers that uh, virtue and happiness go hand in hand. It's, it's really the path to achieving the greatest happiness. And people who uh, are doing things that are not virtuous, that don't demonstrate certain traits like courage and wisdom, they're people who just don't know any better. They don't understand what's good for them as well. And so, you know, ethics has, has kind of taken on this more, uh, you know, legalistic thing, I think, as a mm -hmm. result of uh, some of the you know, modern religion, essentially, that's come since the ancients. But, um, but essentially, so, so virtue is, 
is the kind of admirable traits that we bring out in our behaviors. And values are the way we evaluate those traits. So they're very closely linked and we're essentially, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, we can use them interchangeably, but virtue is sort of the giving end and values are the receiving end. So when, when we observe someone who we admire, right, they're demonstrating their virtues and we are evaluating them according to our values. And if they align mm -hmm. with them, then we admire them. Um, and I, I kind of make the, the case in the middle of the book of how this might have come about evolutionarily um, and, and how our virtues and our values matter so much uh, kind of in terms of our actual brain wiring. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so just to reiterate that, for, again, to get it into my own head, I like that's a really nice way to describe it, particularly so the virtues are the, the behaviors in some sense, right, or the ways of being. And the values the traits, are yeah. the traits, right? And so then the values are, we evaluate those things in others based on our own values. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Nice. That's great. Okay. Um, there was one thing in, in the, I don't know, in my notes here, just this idea, and, and I'm not sure I misunderstood what you were saying or just if you can kind of talk about this, that, that I guess values, if we kind of use the, the terminology that you're talking about values, virtues, ethics, all this kind of things are behavioral, right? So we need to continually cultivate them and practice them and do our best to live in alignment with them. It's not so much that we check a box kind of idea, right? Like I, I'm patient and loving and compassionate. <laughs> And I can check the box and sort of, I no longer have to be that way kind of idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you just maybe talk right. about that a little bit? Yeah. So the, the idea is that our, our brains are really kind of running a simulation to, to, to make evaluations about us ourselves and they're regulating our moods accordingly. And so it's, it's uh, if our brains did evolve to have this function, it's not that easy to trick them, right? Just, just telling yourself, no, I'm compassionate. It's fine. I don't have to actually do anything to bring bring out that trait right i can just tell myself oh no i have all the all the best strengths and i'm the best right it's not going to be very effective i don't think i argue this that the whole like self affirmation and mantras these are kind of well intended it's a lot better than telling yourself you're the worst and blaming yourself all the time but um it it's not really rooted in reality and when we look mm. at the effects of self esteem uh particularly you know in the 90s everyone was re all, like self-esteem was all the rage. People were trying to just tell all the kids that they were the best and they were very special. And, and uh, it didn't really have the effect. It didn't really pan out because uh, people are not that easily tricked into thinking that they have all these admirable traits mm. uh, when they're not seeing it in their own behaviors. And so actually bringing out these traits is a way of showing to your brain that you are this person that you want to think you are. Um, and so it, it absolutely, I think, needs to come out through your actions on a regular basis. Yeah. And I'm curious, it's certainly biased through my own experience of sort of being an addict and alcoholic and all those kind of things. I think I'm jumping ahead of uh, the self-esteem <laughs> question, but it, it fits here. So just like you said, we can't just lie ourselves into feeling good and and certainly you know, the research is pretty clear and I assume you're familiar with like Jean Twenge's work. Um, I'm not sure if you are, but she talks a lot about the whole narcissism epi epidemic mm -hmm. as a result of the whole self-esteem stuff. Um, right, right. She's sort of aligned with Jonathan Haidt. And yeah. Done some sort of work together. But so that being said, going back to this idea of, of trying to li lie to yourself or just talk pleasantly about yourself. Um, so that you feel better. I, how do you think about this idea of the Jungians would call it the shadow, other people just call it darkness or the dark side, or um, how do we get really honest? Or how do you see for people that really do have that dark past or, or have done really terrible things in, in relationship to their own I love, you call it the self-appraisal system or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I love, it's a great term. So yeah, for all the people that are stuck in the dark side, right? Or that do have all this negative past, how did these things apply to them, I guess is the question. 
Yeah, I think the first component is just building awareness of this stuff and and kind of accepting where you are now. Um, mm -hmm. we, we sometimes people will argue that you have to choose between accepting who you are and becoming more than you are. And there's really no reason you have to do that. You should always accept who you are at this moment. And then you should set your aims for the future. And so you should you should accept the past too. You should accept uh, your actions that you're not necessarily proud of in the past. But you should also accept that you, you can't always change that. I mean, you can never change the past. So you, you should focus on what you can do now. And I argue in general, you should focus on, um, you know, bringing out your strengths more so than uh, limiting your weaknesses. I mean, I think I think it's important to look at actual vices sometimes, right? These, these are certainly, I mean, this is the opposite end of a virtue. So if you are taking vicious, corrupt actions, if you're doing things that you're really not proud of, um, then then yeah, very often this is kind of what you need to address and, and change those habits. But I also think that, um, you know, I, I don't really like the sort of blaming ethical system. I prefer, I think it's healthier to focus on the good in general and to focus on what you're great at. And, and if you really bring those strengths out very often, uh, you'll have a high enough opinion of yourself that, that you won't necessarily feel the need to bring out some of those negative behaviors either. And you'll be able to kind of grow out of them. Um, I do on the, on the note of like the shadow work, I made a deck of introspection <laughs> cards called Mindsight. Um, and uh, they have 81 questions that you sort of, you take one, you go on a walk and you write in this little pocket journal. And I think this is, this kind of thing, this introspection is really important for coming to terms with your weaknesses, your shadow, whatever uh, you want to call it, your vices, um, and and kind of understanding how they work better. Right? I also, in, in my first book, I, I talk about uh, psychotecture, this process of, you know, changing your mind and your mental habits. And so I think focusing on some of those micro changes, right, some of the individual emotional algorithms in your mind and, and learning how to rewire some of those can be one of the best approaches, right? Yeah, for sure. How do you, as I sort of mentioned before, and is clear in your experience, sort of the ability to conceptualize what's going on to, I guess, think ahead and to actually act on that is pretty unique um, for people to do that individually, or maybe not unique, but not generally what I've seen uh, in people. And I, I guess I'm just going to bring up kind of, I'm not sure how familiar you are with like AA and the 12 steps. Principally, though, that's a program of like virtue and ethics and moral behavior, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. And a huge part of it is obviously people who end up in those rooms, so to speak, do have a lot of kind of darkness that they need to clear through prior to being able to focus on the good. Yeah. And I'm not sure if I'm just making a statement or asking you a question. Um, <laughs> no, no. But the but so much of it has to be um, interpersonal, right? So so yeah, the one of the main slogans is like, you're not alone, and you can't do this alone. So I guess I'm curious, have you seen I mean, maybe your the community that you've built is an opportunity for people not to do this alone. I guess I just think, or the question in some sense is how, how do you see people working through these more difficult things uh either alone or or how do they find support or in your own experience how have you gotten guidance or support from others um to work through some of that more difficult stuff that because it's hard to i mean we suppress so much of it and and they call it i guess a shadow or the dark side for a reason right it's like we don't want to look or we don't know how to look or whatever so i'm just it's a bit of a statement and a bit of a question. I'm just curious if you could comment on that. Yeah, a few things. I mean, I think I think the interpersonal dimension is huge. Um, you know, most of our virtues, I argue, basically are of interpersonal origin. And so it, we really need other human mm -hmm. beings to be able to bring out these traits and, and to work through some of our other negative traits. Um, I, I'll also say like, um, I kind of I kind of take different mental conditions and do deep dives into them. So I've done, you know, I've done a deep dive into depression and, and the stuff in this book. I've done a deep dive into anxiety and I built a, an anxiety program. 
I have really not done a deep dive into addiction yet. And so I have lots of kind of scattered thoughts and ideas, but I won't pretend to have a really coherent, like full understanding of it. Um, I do, I do appreciate what 12 step programs do. I have a little familiarity with that, but in general, I, I think it's, it's kind of a messy situation because our virtues and our brains and all these things evolved in these very different worlds where we had a uh, close community. We had, you know, basically 150 people that we knew in our lives. And we had mm -hmm. uh, all these, um, you know, we didn't have all the things that we have today that basically hijack our, our neurochemicals, right? We didn't have alcohol. We didn't have all these drugs. We didn't have gambling and social media. And, and so there's so many things that uh, our brains weren't really built to deal with. And I think in many ways we get, we can get trapped in these uh, things that are in some ways designed to trap us and, and we weren't equipped to avoid. So it can be really, really hard to get out of them. Uh, I, I would not frame it necessarily as like a virtue deficiency or something if you are uh, dealing with addiction or something. I think it's a really, um, really unfortunate like situation that we have these uh, huge temptations that many of us are not fully equipped to handle. But I do think that that using this framework as a daily guide. I mean, I talk about like behavioral activation, for example, really mm -hmm. effective for uh, depression. Uh, and I suspect it's got other, you know, uses in addiction and these things, right? Just, just the simple process of setting a daily activity schedule, uh, adding things that, that you think will make you feel good about yourself, um, starting small baby steps, right? But basically creating the schedule and doing these simple things every day. Um, and then gradually working your way up and setting slightly more uh, challenging goals, right? For, that give you more opportunities for pleasure and mastery and bringing out your values. Um, this, this is one of those ways that I think can be really useful for someone who is stuck, who doesn't um, you know, who knows there's like 20 different things they should be doing and they just aren't able to do it. Uh, picking something simple enough, like every day I'm going to take a shower and clean up my room a little bit. And if I just do that, right, then mission accomplished. And then I move on to the next day, gradually working yourself out of these vicious cycles. Uh, it, it's one of the best methods for doing it. And, and it's one of the very, um, not necessarily easy, but simple approaches that, that people can do if they're stuck. Yeah. Awesome. And okay. Uh, maybe I'll just comment on that a bit, but I do want to ask you about how, or if you got support from other people or how you kind of use that interpersonal thing in your own journey. Although since you just mentioned it, you just basically described the 12 steps. No, not totally, right. but uh, it is a program of action. And it, there's a saying that was beat into my head early on. You can't think your way into right action. You have to act your way into right thinking, which is basically mm -hmm. exactly kind of what you're describing. And, yeah. and they always say it's simple, not easy, which is kind of like a spiritual slogan, or at least in my understanding. And exactly what you said, you know, just do one thing, <laughs> one thing <laughs> at a time or yeah. just one thing a day. And that I think in my experience, at least I was so and this is connecting a few different ideas, which I was going to get to later, I guess. But, you know, this idea, which you commented on briefly, too, is like these these positive affirmations and pretending that things are different than how they are. There's a part of our consciousness that just knows it's total bullshit, right? Like it's mm -hmm. like we can't lie to ourselves, so to speak. Yeah. And you also mentioned, which I really liked towards the end of the book sort of some of the shortcomings of, of sort of like cognitive behavioral therapy or like reappraising our thoughts or whatever, when, when our negative thoughts are true, <laughs> right? Like <laughs> how, what do we do about them? So to speak. And so for me yeah. to kind of make it, uh, put a real life example on it, it was like, you know, I lied all the time. I avoided responsibility. I was terrified of facing my problems, all that kind of stuff. And so I couldn't use even really maybe some reframing or whatever was mm -hmm. if I just take it one day at a time, maybe I can change. Although all those negative thoughts and self appraisals were somewhat true at the time. And the only way to free myself from that again, which you bring up in the book, which is a huge part of the 12 step process is 
if I start to act in such a way that is admirable or that I would admire, then maybe I can learn to admire myself um, mm -hmm. or, or, or at least stop hating myself so much. <laughs> then yeah. I can get to the, the part of, of ad, sort of living in alignment with more admirable values. Um, mm -hmm. And so maybe just, I was going to ask you this later, but it's come up now, just that <laughs> idea of, yeah, what do we do or how do you see what to do with the negative thoughts or self appraisals when they're actually true? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I will point out that, you know, cognitive therapy has um, a lot of efficacy in, in certain scenarios. No I think no it, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a For very sure. good thing when you're, yeah, like you say, when your thoughts are distorted and your beliefs aren't true. And, and the, the tricky thing about that is you don't really know if your beliefs are true or not because you believe them, right? And so right. using that process is a good way of sorting out, oh, I'm really distorting this, you know, going in and, and identifying these distortions of black and white thinking or, um, you know, all these all these other distortions and, and saying, oh, this this belief I have fits this, right? Actually correcting these things and replacing them with more accurate, more balanced healthy alternative beliefs. This is a very effective process. It's when our, our brains know on some level that it really isn't true what we're trying to tell ourselves that it becomes a problem. And so, yeah, I think I think in that case, that, that behavioral activation that I talked about is huge, the daily activity schedule. Uh, but I think there, there are other approaches, um, you know, I think you should I think you should really pay attention to and write down the people that you admire and specifically mm -hmm. the traits you admire about them, right? What are their virtues that you look at and say, wow, I, I would love to be that way. And then basically, you know, create a, a whole blueprint for yourself uh, based on this and say, okay, here are the, the virtues I most want to embody every day. How can, I, how can I gradually do this more and more? If you've fallen into a pattern of like compulsive lying, right? Then, then even taking a single action choosing to tell the truth at one at one moment is a step towards doing that i mean you could you can literally like incrementally gradually work up how often you are like choosing honesty on a daily basis mm -hmm. and just work on increasing that number slowly and so um i think that's that's huge and then as you do kind of climb up more and more out of like a depressive state or if you were never depressed but you really don't know um, where to go next. Maybe you're fine, but you're not fantastic in your life. I encourage people to focus on, you know, their virtue domains, right? I talk about how your work, your relationships, your community, um, you know, anything like, the, you know, the, the animal shelter you volunteer at, your relationship with your brother, these are all potentially virtue domains. These are areas of your life that you are able to bring out these strengths th through. And so if you don't have you know, and sadly, there are a lot of people out there who don't have relationships, they don't have uh, work, they're unemployed, they, they don't have a community. Uh, I mean, in fact, like 99% of us don't have community, because that's kind of a ancient concept to us now, unfortunately. <laughs> so these are all, all uh, limitations to our ability to bring out these virtues. If, if we are mm. just if it's just us by ourselves, we're really going to be limited. And, and so tending to these virtue domains, asking how can I improve them so that more of my strengths are able to come out? Do I make a job change or a career change, right? Is this relationship healthy for me or is it suppressing my, my personal strengths, right? These, these are the kind of questions that you need to ask. And at some point you even need to ask, do I need to create a new in vessel entirely for my virtues? And this is really kind of what I did with designing the mind. I mean, I, I kind of asked myself, you know, I, I was at the time I was kind of stuck in this job that wasn't really bringing out my greatest strengths. Um, my, my communities were pretty limited. I said, how can I combine all these different strengths and passions that I've developed through my life into one thing? And I kind of built this whole, you know, mind form and it's a community and it's my work and it's what I'm good at. And so um, really that all, all the way up this sort of mood scale, there are strategies for bringing out more and more of those strengths in your life. So just asking that question, how can I get a little closer to being that person I most admire? How can I, you know, just take one step to, to get a little better and bring out my virtues more? Yeah. Thank you.
I think just to comment a little bit, so much again of what you described is analogous to the process of healing through like a 12 step program for all its mm. faults and whatever else, as you say, there, we don't have communities real. I mean, there's a, there's a emptiness, I think of, of community and sort of that cultural ethos of being together and common values, common virtues being talked about and, and learning from each other. And, you know, AA provides community, provides structure, it provides support, all those kind of things. Um, and I know there's, you know, it's not for everybody, there's shortcomings to it, all that is true as well. But I think it's helpful to point that out. And you, you told an interesting story of, uh, I think it was like a new employee at one of the jobs you were at, and you told her you were going to write a book. And she was like, <laughs> are you joking me kind of thing? Um, yeah. So I guess I'm, and this was one question I was going to ask you earlier. I often find it difficult to help people who are in addiction or just generally suffering in particular ways, uh, find community, right? Or maybe they're just not the type of person where that's just going to work for them, right? Or they have too many, they're not totally aligned with like an AA model, but they don't want to go to like some sort of support group. It's tricky. Um, how did you get support or did you get support or did you just, I know you talk a lot about, uh, or not so much in this book, but in your previous work, um, you talk about, uh, David Burns's work, which he really has done. He's great. Uh, he really is great. Um, but yeah, how did you do all this? Did you do it all by yourself, so to speak? And like for the people that aren't, aren't drawn to some form of community or group practice, like how do you, like to me, it's just so foreign. Like I, <laughs> I could never do anything by myself. Like I needed help and I needed guidance and all that kind of stuff. So it was a bit of a rambling question, but I think it makes sense. No, yeah, it does make sense. And that's a good point. Um, I will say I have always been a very solitary, autonomous, kind of self-sufficient person. That's just how I'm wired. And so mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've never um, really had relationships that I seek, um, like emotional support from in that mm -hmm. way. Like I have relationships right. that provide me with a lot of great things, right? A lot of like fun and adventure and, and without my partner, I share in the book and her yeah. like just, uh, being someone who loved me and, and who would play goofy pranks on me and go on <laughs> adventures with me. Like it, it would have been a lot worse probably, but I would, I would generally say I, I kind of found my way through it. Um, yeah, without necessarily like relying on a lot of other people, I think uh, it, in some ways I'm I'm like jealous of people who are wired that way because, um, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, social uh, social connection and that whole like, uh, you know, that whole thing has never come as easily to me. But mm -hmm. um, luckily, I've had I've had a lot of support from a lot of like dead philosophers and stuff yeah, over yeah, the yeah. years. And, yeah. and, uh, and that's provided me with a lot of important skills. I think even, you know, when I was going through this challenge that we're referencing, I knew it would be temporary. I knew there was a lot in my life that was sort of, um, you know, really kind of unpleasant. You, you mentioned this uh, coworker who mm -hmm. just took mm -hmm. this, you know, visceral dislike to me pretty much from the start. That, that's kind of nothing I've ever experienced before. But um, there, you know, I, I uh, yeah, I shared my book with her. I tried to kind of like relate to her and, and empathize with her. And uh, yeah, no, there was there was no changing that basically. And 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 at the time, um, yeah, I didn't I didn't have a lot of other evidence teaching my brain otherwise. So even though on some level I knew that what this person thinks about me isn't really true, it does it doesn't really matter to me. Um, you know, I had very few people in my life. There was a pandemic going on at the time, so I didn't have any community. I had my partner luckily, but, um, yeah, I, I was part-time at my job. I was kind of just, I had become a supplementary asset because I was writing my book on the other days. Um, and so, yeah, in general, I, I, uh, kind of fell into a difficult time and, and a lot of what, what got me out of it honestly was, um, switching the company that I worked for, uh, being able to, get out and, and interact with people again, post pandemic and um, publishing this book and basically creating a new kind of career for myself where I, I am able to bring out those strengths much better than I was 
doing kind of engineering drawings and, and uh, stuff I wasn't really good at and didn't really enjoy doing. So yeah, in general, um, I, I, I think the people in my life have, have certainly helped me, uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, thank you. It's it's helpful to hear that. And as you say, I'm on like the other side of that spec. Like, I mean, I'm self sufficient in many ways, but not in this type of way. And so yeah, I've had I've had to have a lot of guidance, which I'm incredibly grateful for. Um, and, and, and in some ways, analogous to what you're saying in terms of in in choosing a sponsor in a a they always say, find someone who has something that you want, right? And not like a nice car, right? Like mm -hmm. a way of being a personality, sort of like an ethic, right? That you admire and that you want to emulate, which yeah. again is, is sort of exactly kind of what you're describing. Um, okay, I think maybe, uh, let me get back to some of my questions about your book. I guess it's all in some ways about the book, but oh, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I think... Okay, because I will just continue rambling or, or asking you random questions. Okay, um, go for it. I like that. Better. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. Um, okay, I asked you that. Um, oh yeah, one thing I'm curious, and, and I know you're not sort of like a biologist or an evolutionary psychologist, whatever, but you mentioned sort of this difference between, and maybe it's just my misunderstanding, between sexual selection and uh, survival, so to speak. Right. Yeah. So we're wired for survival and, and just, and is it, is it a little bit of a sidestep, but we'll draw it back into everything else. Uh, my understanding in some ways is that sexual selection is just part of our survival instinct. Yeah. And maybe I, you yeah, know, maybe I'm not understanding exactly what you were saying, but in, um, how do you kind of parse those things out? And then how does that again fit into, which I really liked how you, and maybe it fits into like this idea of like virtue signaling. Mm -hmm. And I really liked, I really liked how you described all of that. Right. And, and how it's sort of been a bit distorted in modern times. Yeah. Evolutionary psychology is, is one of these fields that's, um, I, I've basically dug into everything I could find on it once I discovered it. Cause I think it's kind of like the future of psychology. I think, uh, you know, it's kind of emerging at the moment, but really this idea that all of our mental phenomena have origins and functions and they're there for a reason because they helped our ancestors, uh, you know, pass on their genes at one point, understanding how the struggles we're having today relate to these origins and functions, I think can be really useful. And so this is, um, this is how I've come to understand these mental challenges and well-being and depression and self-esteem. Um, so Jeffrey Miller is an evolutionary psychologist who has made this argument in a book called The Mating Mind uh, that a lot of these traits that we think of as, um, y you know, uniquely human, right, our creative intelligence, you know, our generosity, you know, all these things that we don't see in other animals and that, that require our advanced sort of brains, um, they they are often assumed to have some kind of survival purpose. So we need them to outsmart predators and, and to be able to find food and, and stuff like that. Um, but he argues that really, uh, in many ways, these are more like the peacock's tail, right? And so the, the peacock's tail demonstrates sexual selection very well. Uh, basically, it, it acts against the actual survival of the organism in many ways, right? It, uh, the peacock's tail is this big elaborate target on its back for predators, right? It, it makes it, uh, you know, it costs more energy in order to have a tail like that. So it requires more food, right? It doesn't make sense for pure survival. And that's why Darwin said it, you know, it made him sick at the sight of a peacock's feather because he just couldn't figure it out initially. What we eventually figured out about it is that basically the fact that it is harder to survive as a peacock with this big, beautiful, elaborate tail is exactly why it has been selected by natural selection. Um, and it's because 
it serves as a fitness indicator. So if a peacock is not particularly fit, it's not able to grow and survive with a tail like that. And so it's actually working against it, but it's still able to, um, the, fit, the fitter individuals with these elaborate tails are able to survive and it serves as a, as a uh, fitness indicator to mm -hmm. mates that this is a really fit individual. And so Miller argues, this is what these mental traits are, is they're sort of like these beautiful feathers on, on exotic birds, right? We have, uh, you know, artistic inclinations, not because art is actually good for our survival. We don't need to write books in order to survive or, you know, compose symphonies, um, but it demonstrates something about our fitness. If we're able to, we must be pretty well connected and resourceful and, um, you know, able to provide for ourselves if we're engaging in these kind of luxuries. Generosity is the same way. If you choose to you know, give up some of your food for someone or do something kind, well, you wouldn't be able to survive doing that kind of thing if you were just barely making it. So you must be a pretty fit individual. And so basically all of these human virtues, uh, or at least a large portion of them, I think are rooted in this kind of social sexual selection landscape um, where we're all kind of going around virtue signaling in a way, we're all mm -hmm. demonstrating these traits that we evolved to have um, specifically because they make us more appealing to potential allies, to our tribe and to potential mates as well. Um, and so this is the origin of these traits. But the interesting thing about it is that if this is really so important to our genes that we uh, demonstrate these traits and, and, and show them off essentially to our tribe, uh, then, then it makes sense that there would be a mechanism in our brains for evaluating our own strengths, for, for constantly monitoring ourselves, thinking through and evaluating, okay, am I good at this? Am I bad at this? Um, and, and that's essentially what we see in self-esteem. Another thinker, Mark Leary, uh, in the evolutionary space, argued that this is what self-esteem is. It's called the, the sociometer theory of self-esteem. Mm -hmm. Um, he didn't necessarily connect it to Jeffrey Miller's work, but he said, uh, basically, this is a simulation our brain is running to improve social outcomes. Um, and so it's like it, 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 he says, um, or at least the, the writers of one study say, like, if, if, you're, if you take a taste of milk and it, you spit it out because it tastes spoiled and bad, um, you don't think to yourself like, oh, our, our milk tasting function malfunctioned or something, right? You think to yourself, oh, it's working properly. It's doing what it's meant to. And so essentially when, when we have low self-esteem, it's not from an evolutionary standpoint, necessarily our brain malfunctioning. It's not uh, a problem in that sense. It, it was meant to form a low, uh, low opinion of us based on those uh, observations that it's making. And I think the reason it does this is in order to regulate our moods and bring about certain behaviors that are more fitting for certain social environments. So when our brains conclude, oh, you know, you're not likely to be approved of because I'm not seeing evidence that you have these traits, right? It basically shuts things down. It puts on the red light and says, okay, we're going to lower your mood and we're going to have you withdraw socially. We're going to have you adopt socially risk averse behaviors. So you don't risk offending someone or alienating your tribe. Right. And this is the kind of behaviors that we see in people who are depressed. Right. And similarly, people who are really deeply fulfilled almost always have very high, healthy self-esteem. They have positive views of, of themselves and they have a lot of vitality. They have the energy to go out and, and actually put themselves out there and demonstrate their traits. And this is, I think, what would make sense if this is a sort of social simulator in our brains. Now, the, the problem that's worth pointing out is that our brains don't have complete information about us and our social standing, right? So, so, you know, we don't always, people don't always come right up to us and tell us what they think about us, for example. <laughs> and so our brains need to be fairly competent at just evaluating us ourselves based on our own values in the same way we would evaluate someone else. And this is essentially what's going on when we have an internal monologue. It's our brain evaluating us based on these virtues and values that we admire in other people. And it's, it's what's really regulating this mood. So this is, this is kind of the theory underneath the simpler uh, map idea that I introduce in the three dimensions. This is uh, a theory that uh, is, is pretty speculative. It's called virtue self-signaling theory. 
but it's pretty interesting and I'm, I'm weaving together a lot of findings from a lot of different fields. So it'll be really interesting to see how it holds up over time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's so much in all of that, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is it's so interesting. That self-appraisal sociometer mm -hmm. idea, and maybe we described it already in, in people who generally are depressed or who are struggling, it gets skewed, right? So, so maybe we, is it that we, uh, over attribute certain realities? So, and, and in that withdrawing, we feed the monster that's keeping us in a negative mind state, you know, like, yeah, I, yeah. Does that, there's so many things going through my head at once. I'll just stop with that. Right. And it's like, yeah, yeah. how do we then discern? <laughs> yeah. How do we discern that? Yeah. It's, it's not easy to discern here. Here's what I'll say about this mechanism. I imagine yeah. it would have been much more accurate 10,000 years ago. I imagine right. that uh, our brains would have been much more likely to form correct conclusions about our virtues mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. when we didn't live in this modern globalized world that is so different from our ancient one. I think there is a lot of, um, you know, a lot of just weird signals that we get today that aren't really what we're, you know, intended, aren't what our brains were built for. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, like I said, we don't have tribes of 150 people anymore. We have lots of strangers around us all the time and acquaintances and we change locations and, and you know, workplaces, you know, school cohorts, right? There's so many uh, mm -hmm. different ways that our communities work. And so our brains get different signals, right? Some of our social interaction comes from social media and, and email and stuff, like, you know, these platforms that really, you know, we didn't evolve to make sense of. And so it, it does kind of make sense that we would come to wrong conclusions more often about our self-worth and that we would need something like cognitive therapy to go in and, and sort out those wrong beliefs. Um, but, but, you know, I think also if you look at your life and you say, okay, I feel like I, you know, I don't ever leave the house. I don't ever do anything. I'm not uh, bringing out any of these strengths because I'm just playing video games all day, right? Then that, that's probably like, that's the, the, your brain is not malfunctioning in that case. And mm -hmm. you need to, you know, step in with your behaviors and start making actual changes. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's unfortunate that, that our brains do have this tendency to, uh, get skewed and distorted. And this is easy to identify in someone else. It's very hard to identify in yourself. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Okay. And I, I, I do think this fundamental underlying notion of acting in a way that we would admire or that we admire in others is so important and, and almost like is a through line through all of this. And for those people who can figure that stuff out sort of on their own, in a sense, which, which you're one of those people that's amazing for other people. If you need help, get help, right? It's sort of, I know it's simple to say yeah. that, but, um, and it's not always easy to find, but I, I also do like your reference of, you know, there's lots of dead people and books and teachers all over <laughs> the place that we can access, uh, at least their teachings and their wisdom and all that kind of stuff and try to integrate it into our own lives. And I don't want to forget to ask you about this. So, I guess jumping to kind of another concept in the book, this idea of the self, right? Um, and you sort of give an example of sort of the, <laughs> there's, I can't remember exactly how it goes. It was pretty funny. You were like uh, describing the principles of, you could say like Buddhism, so to speak, right? Like transcend your yourself and live free and you've just achieved enlightenment kind of thing. Um, I can't remember exactly right. how you said it, but it was quite, uh, it was funny. Uh, so I, I, I think, so maybe I'll give you my thoughts about it. Tell me if it's accurate to what you were saying, and then maybe you can just comment on it. I think yeah, my understanding, and I've been fortunate to have a really great teacher. And then also recently I've sort of been following Sam Harris's work on his app, which I find he's, he's such a, he's so clear in his teaching. And I think he does a great job. My understanding is, is that what we're really cultivating is just the, and you, I think it's so, sort of analogous to the self appraisal system, but it is that we, we, we want to identify with the observing 
like of conscious awareness. And then it's not that the self isn't important, right? Or having a self sense of self isn't important. It's just that if we get over identified with that, then in some sense that starts impacting our self-esteem because it's, if my interpretation of myself is good, then I get a boost of self-esteem. If it's bad, then I lose that sort of sense of self-esteem. And so we're just trying to uncouple that attachment, right, to the sense of self. And I think, at least for me, that subtlety of I understand the self, at least as it arises in my consciousness and my thought stream and my emotions, da, 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 da. in some sense, it is an illusion, right? Or it's a temporary experience in my mind. And it passes. And then, you know, it's a sort of back and forth flow of experience. And And I think... So those, that's my thoughts and that's my interpretation of what you're saying. And I think you were sort of saying how the sense of self really does matter and it is important and all that kind of stuff, which I do agree with. Although I just think the subtlety is that we can have both in a sense, right? The the no self, right? The The awareness that we're not this concept and creature that we perceive in our head. Uh, and at the same time that that serves a purpose and is useful in the world. Yeah, yeah. So that's so, my best yeah, attempt to kind of <laughs> sift through that because, you know, people have been discussing this for thousands of years, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, very well put. Um, so I, I would say first, I, I agree with the no self doctrine. I think that right. we really are not this unified decision maker in our head, but a, a complex aggregate of all these different perceptions and desires and um, and so I think the, the Buddha was right. Sam Harris is right about this. And I think generally mindfulness uh, is a healthy practice. Uh, the reason why I think it's healthy is I, I, um, I don't say this in the book, but I've written about it in articles. You think about it like playing a video game. Um, you know, when you uh, if you're playing a game where you have to like level up a character, um, you know, when that character dies or something bad happens in the game, you don't go getting, you know, super upset all the time because, you know, it's just a game and it's just a character you're sort of playing. Um, but at the same time, you still play the game and you still try to level up the character as much as you can. It's kind of cool that the term character has a double meaning because in real life, mm. the game is to level up your own character, essentially, um, to, to build out these virtues. That's the game. That's what actually enables you to win and experience this deep happiness. But I think it's good to also have the ability to step back and say, it is just a game. It is just a character. It's not real in a sense. And being able to examine your thoughts and your emotions as just thoughts and emotions and not necessarily as the deepest kind of reality. Right. I think that those very much go hand in hand. What I argue against in the book is treating self-transcendence like the ultimate end or treating mm -hmm. ego death as uh, as the end goal of our life, the enlightenment we should all be pursuing. This is kind of an unquestionable idea in spirituality and self-help and even like Silicon Valley. Everyone's talking about getting rid of your ego and your sense of self. And I don't think this would be ideal. I think this is, I say it's like, you know, if, if having a really negative, strong sense of self is like a negative one on this scale, um, mm -hmm. then, then this ego transcendence, ego death is a zero essentially, which it's, it's neutral. It's a big step up from hating yourself, right? But you can also get up to positive one where you have a real deep approval of who you are. It's a gradual process. I think, you, you know, um, making use of mindfulness and meditation and uh, generally building cognitive uh, metacognitive awareness is very much conducive to this long-term goal. But keep the long-term goal in mind. Aim for eudaimonia of being a person you really approve of uh, in all your strengths and all your virtues and traits. Um, don't just aim for having no self, right? That's That would be my my advice and my conclusion, but then I'm also, I've never been enlightened. I've never transcended my <laughs> ego completely. So I can't fully compare the two. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, I, I got your book here and I'm just trying to find that sentence was just so good. Do you remember kind of what you said about like, there were a lot you of, sum, you basically, <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. You basically like summed up the sort of, I don't know what you would call it, like like a fair kind of poke, and, and that's my own interpretation of kind of this whole path to no self, like just 
recognize there's no self, free yourself from attachment and you've achieved enlightenment. Good job. You've just, you know, <laughs> something right. like that. It was so funny. <laughs> you've officially um, become a guru or whatever. Yeah, just, yeah, just yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't I, I, um, I'd have to look back at the exact wording too. Okay, yeah, yeah, me too. But it was <laughs> actually, I think you, I think it was something like you, you've officially become a guru. I think. Yeah, I think that's. I, I, I actually, I think I am on your page there. Like, and the whole. Have you heard of the term Mick mindfulness? Mick, my oh, I, I can imagine what that refers to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. <laughs> Which sort of, sort of like the marketization or the materialistic yeah, yeah. form of mindfulness, what clearly is going on in, in Silicon Valley. Yeah. I always, do you know who Jack Cornfield is? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I always kind of, you know, my own judgment comes up when I see him at like Silicon Valley mindfulness conference. Like, right. Uh, consciousness and technology like it just seems so kind of backwards but um where we sort of delude ourselves into being i don't know no selves and conscious actors so that we can just go on acting unethically um yeah yeah anyways, it's kind of what we a bit of judgment <laughs> yeah it's kind of what Sorry, we have to ahead. expect yeah. in in uh capitalism everything <laughs> that, that catches on is going to be monetized in some way there's, there's mixed stoicism too basically everyone's trying to use yeah. <laughs> a philosophy that's fundamentally about uh not worrying about your external circumstances as a way of improving their external circumstances and success so anything that that catches on today is going to be turned into a way to make more money and and uh serve the machine but um no i mean overall it's probably a good good mm -hmm, thing that mm -hmm. this movement has become so huge in the mindfulness space. Yeah, I agree. And can you talk a bit about the, I think it's Ryan Holiday's book, Ego is the Enemy kind of idea. I, I, I and maybe it's just the, uh, what do you call it? Um, the publishers, <laughs> you know, <laughs> putting a title on his book to make it sell. Um, but just, okay. yeah, what do you think about the idea that the ego isn't per se the enemy, it's just part of our experience. And, and how do you kind of think about that and integrating it into, you know, going back to this idea of our virtues and our values and our ways of being to be well? Yeah. I, so I, I will say I haven't actually read the book, The Ego is the Enemy. I read some of Holiday's Yeah, stuff, me neither. Um, me neither. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I mean, that message is very prevalent today. And there's lots of people saying, like, keep your identity small, for example. This is this is certainly it has its place, particularly in like um, forming correct beliefs and making good judgments. I think our our identity and our ego create motivated biases, essentially desires to believe things that aren't the case. And I've certainly been around people in, in my work who, uh, you know, weren't able to make the, the clearly right decision uh, because they were trying to serve their ego instead of trying to see the situation clearly. They were looking for evidence that the, the thing they were doing was right instead of really looking at the data and saying what's correct. So there are lots of ways that are sense of self and our identity can can interfere with our goals. Um, but in, in terms of our actual happiness, I think the idea that the ego is the enemy is a problem. Because if, if I'm right about the actual mechanism behind the ego, the self appraisal system, it's responsible for some of the worst suffering, but but also some of the greatest happiness possible. You know, when you really feel feel deeply fulfilled in your life and satisfied, that's because your ego is functioning and, and it's observing you and it's saying, I am proud of the person I am. I'm, I love this person that I have become and that I'm acting out every day. And so um, I think the ego can be the enemy or it can be your best friend and really learning how to work with it and how to how to hack it in a way, how to make your ego uh, approve of you instead of disapprove of you is the key. But the, the ego... Um, Ultimately, yeah, if, if I'm right, happiness is only here because of this self-appraisal system. That's why we evolved to have a, a deep sense of well-being is to regulate our moods and our behaviors in this way. Yeah. And, and maybe to add on to that, or I'm curious how you would think about this. It kind of goes back to some of the things we've already said and that you kind of outline in the book is this sort of self-appraisal system 
and and it's so easy to lie to ourselves, right? And so when we uh, kind of like what you were just describing, the person who doesn't want to look at the data or whatever it is to make a decision based on kind of facts, right? Or, or the reality. Uh, one of my one of my actually really my main teacher, she would always say. I just want to make sure we're all in the same reality right now kind of idea <laughs> to, to clarify this, like, what are we talking about exactly? Right. Um, but for, for people who get stuck in a distorted perception of reality, and then they justify their behaviors based on that, would you argue that they're lacking that um, the virtue foundation or the ethical foundation for upon which they're perceiving themselves, or maybe it's that self appraisal system, sociometer kind of idea. And then how do we, I guess, guide people when they're a bit in our, my interpretation lost <laughs> in their, in their appraisal system. Yeah. But it's interesting kind of getting to the, I think the feedback cycle between our beliefs and our behaviors and how, um, you know, I, I lay out kind of depression as being a, a feedback loop uh, between our thoughts and behaviors and emotions uh, to the point where, you know, we aren't taking the actions that we are proud of, right? We have idle behaviors or something. Um, and that causes us to form negative beliefs about ourselves, which then causes us to have a low mood, which then causes us not to want to take the actions that we'd be proud of, which then caught. So it, it's a, it's a continual loop, certainly. Um, and, and so I, I wouldn't say necessarily that, that there's uh, like a virtue deficiency behind the distorted beliefs. I think a big part of that is just sorting out those beliefs. But I do think if you do have those distorted beliefs, then you're going to be less motivated to do the actions that you want and, and so on. It's going to keep you in this cycle. Um, so really, yeah, I mean, I, I, built a whole program based on this um, kind of the ideas in the book that that's very much like a 30 day exercise every day, kind of starting very simple for people who are at this point, but a big part of it centers around, um, yeah, the recognition that your thoughts are not reality and the kind of diffusion that uh, again is the big value I see in, in things like mindfulness. Um, mm -hmm. And then the kind of the uh, identifying your virtues and, and, learning to just start logging your thoughts, if nothing else, start, start writing down the thoughts and beliefs behind your moods. And then lastly, yeah, that, that behavioral activation, I think if you use these in combination, even taking it, you know, baby steps one at a time, you can gradually sort of reverse this vicious cycle and turn it into a virtuous cycle where your behaviors are serving your beliefs about yourself, which is serving your mood, which is then serving those behaviors and so on. And so really, um, yeah, turning the turning the vicious cycle into a virtuous virtuous cycle is uh, is kind of the key here, and and there are a few important leverage points that I think those exercises kind of tap into and can change. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and how I guess as we sort of get towards the end of our time, I'm curious, and maybe a connection between sort of our societal values, and I know we're very much talking about sort of our individual stuff, but I think what recent world events have done to me is to maybe have more faith or belief in sort of a virtuous value-based way of being and then seeing how that scales throughout a society, right? Or a civilization even. And this obviously isn't a new question. It's been brought up many times and is being spoken about now. Do you think that as a, for a healthy society, quote unquote, or a good society or whatever, how do, how did do these things influence that? And then lastly, do you think that I have a colleague, he's a professor of political science at the University of Toronto. His specialty is in, I'm going to, is like human rights and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but our human rights, uh, is a civilizational or a Western concept in some sense. And I do think it is based on these virtues and these values and whatnot. And it seems like we are in a, I can't remember who wrote the book. Uh, 
I think Nietzsche wrote or somebody wrote it something a long time. Oh no, it was Freud, maybe clash of civilizations or something like that. But it seems like we're in this weird battle of values, right? Or, or ethics or something between Western civilization and the world. And I'm not sure if you're sort of comfortable talking about that or you have many thoughts on it, but I do think it really matters. And I think we really need to fucking remind ourselves of like these things, not only individually, but collectively and, I'm just going to stop talking. I hope that's a coherent question. (laughs) Absolutely. It's a great question. So Martin Seligman and Christopher Peterson have done a lot of studies of human virtues and character strengths. And uh, one of the things they found that's that I make pretty central to this book is that Mm -hmm. there are a list. I mean, you can slice it up a lot of different ways. They break it up into 24 different virtues uh, that are pretty much observed throughout cultures, right? Every culture, even like indigenous tribes that have very little interaction with Western civilization, we still observe these, uh, these virtues and, and these values that are pretty much universally valued. And so I, I do think there is a common core behind all of this. Um, and, and uh, when we look at, you know, things like political differences, we assume that, you know, people on the left and right or in different parts of the world have very different values. And actually what it mostly boils down to, um, based on my research, is different beliefs. And beliefs can be very different. I mean, we can have entire worldviews made up of constellations of beliefs that clash with others um, entirely. But and, and you can understand the interaction between beliefs and values uh, if you kind of imagine, like, like imagine you're on a, a bus or something and you overhear two people talking and one of them is just berating the other one, just like tearing them apart, saying some really mean things. Uh, you know, most likely you're going to feel like that violates your values. That doesn't embody the benevolence and the humanity that you value. Right. Um, but if you find out a, a minute later, oh, they were actually like rehearsing for a play and they were they're trying to raise awareness about bullying or something, you know, um, that that's a very different belief and and it affects the way you evaluate what's going on now you approve of what's going on um so but it's not that your values changed in that matter of minutes you didn't suddenly you know take a 180 it's that your understanding of the situation changed and that affects the way that your values are expressed and so you know we live in a world now where where there are so many different beliefs i mean you would have pretty much been on the same page as your tribe back in back in the day, but now there's the internet, there's, there's religion, there's all these different belief systems. Uh, and it's kind of an all you can eat buffet. And that means that people end up ending, uh, people end up in very different places in terms of their worldviews. And that results in what appears to be a lot of different values clashing. Uh, but I don't actually think it's different values. I think it's different beliefs about the world and, and the ideal world. And, um, the best way of getting from point A to point B. Uh, lots of different beliefs, unfortunately. Um, and so that that does create problems, but I don't think it's necessarily a problem of very different values. Um, I will say mm-hmm. that different cultures certainly prioritize certain values and highlight them above others. And certain incentive systems uh, motivate us toward things that aren't even a part of our values. You know, like mm-hmm. like our world is so capital centered and profit centered, even though like our ancestors would have had no notion of profit. They were nomadic. They didn't hoard things. They couldn't hoard things. They didn't have currency. Um, our brains didn't evolve to have uh, this currency thing that we have today. And, and we didn't have to think about profits. And so this is kind of a, a proxy virtue, you could say. It's not really something that we value, but it's something that we're so incentivized towards and, and in some ways so forced to pay attention to that it ends up overriding those values in many cases. And, and on a broad scale, this has, you know, really dangerous implications, especially in combination with all this insane technology that we also weren't uh, equipped with the wisdom to be able to wield properly. So um, yeah, lots of, lots of problems, but I don't think they're problems of different values. I think they're different Mm -hmm. beliefs and incentives distorting how those values play out. Right. Interesting. Okay. Maybe lastly, on in that realm, your your understanding of sort of the Stoics or ancient philosophy and like living the good life and and those kind of ideas. How do you think that stuff 
can contribute to more cohesion in the world, so to speak, right? Less conflict and that kind of thing. It's a good question. Um, in some ways, I think uh, we really can't necessarily rely on any of these ancient philosophers for from a societal standpoint, because none of them had any concept of artificial intelligence and nuclear war and all the things that we're <laughs> facing now. So, so many of these thinkers provided very effective guides for the good life for individuals, uh, but not necessarily guides for effective harmony um, on a on a globalized collective mm -hmm. scale. Um, you know, I my, my favorite thinker in this space is Daniel Schmachtenberger. I'm listening to him <laughs> above anyone else in terms of how to best structure society. And um, and I mean, even he, frankly, is relatively pessimistic, but he's making efforts to understand uh, the stuff that our brains weren't built to understand and, and uh, you know, how to how to actually potentially step in and, and change things and, and structure thing, things to be conducive to individual well-being. So I think uh, in terms of, of individual well-being, these ancient mm -hmm. thinkers are just as relevant now as they ever were because they're still... Uh, things going on in the world around us that we can't control. And uh, there's things going on in our mind that uh, really haven't changed. Human nature hasn't fundamentally changed and we can control that. So I think, uh, you know, learning the the path to personal happiness from these ancient thinkers is good. Uh, in many ways, the path to collective happiness is uh, uncharted territory. And so we have to uh, have to figure a lot of this out for ourselves if, if we've got a shot. Right on. Thank you. Yeah, that's I like that. That's a honest and I think accurate description of, of everything that's going on. Yeah, I, I, I've listened to I haven't listened to Daniel in a while, but I do think he does think quite clearly on these things. And he's got a lot of interesting things to say. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, I guess just anything that we kind of haven't discussed or anything from the book that didn't come up or any sort of other thoughts, ideas, things that you're thinking about right now or finding useful. And um, if you want to kind of talk about anything like that. Man, we uh, we covered a lot. I could I could <laughs> keep going for hours probably, but uh, I will I will just say, um, you know, we we talked a little bit about the importance of community and finding mentors and people that you admire and can learn from. And I would put forward Mindform, the the kind of community and and mental training platform that I've built as a mm -hmm. as an option for people. We have you know meetings every week. We have uh, online programs for depression and anxiety, and so. Uh, it's it's a really cool community that's not really like anything else I've been a part of. So um, you, you can apply and join that if you want. It's called Mindform. Um, but I'll also say, um, you know, you can uh, I give away a couple free books to listeners for these kind of things. Um, so you can put in the show notes if you want. Designing the mind dot org slash psychotecture. Uh, I'll, I'll send you the psychotext toolkit and the book of self mastery, which is kind of a a quote compilation on a lot of these ideas and um, you know, become who you are will be available for pre-order very soon, potentially when this airs. So um, yeah, I, I look forward to sharing that with everyone, but yeah, if um, you know, if you have any other questions or anything, hit me, but uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. And yeah, certainly all that stuff will be in the show notes where people can track you down and, and learn more about your work. Um, yeah, so the book, again, as you just sort of mentioned, but I will reiterate, Become Who You Are, A New Theory of Self-Esteem, Human Greatness, and the Opposite of Depression. Uh, go out and get it or pre-order it and all that kind of thing. Um, actually, yeah, I guess as I'm talking, and one thing I did forget to ask you about uh, is self-compassion. Hmm. I'm, I'm Maybe we can just riff on that for a few minutes. Like um, one thing that I learned about i find self-compassion so beautiful and helpful and empowering um, and it's it's sort of presented by christian neff and chris germer as an antidote to self-esteem right or an alternative approach to dealing with kind of human experience and mm -hmm. it where it's not based on the superficial sense of self-esteem which you kind of pointed out it's more yeah how do we relate to suffering in a way that is compassionate and not needing to change experience 
and then also how do we relate to well-being and our good and positive traits, um, which I think is somewhat analogous to the self-appraisal sort of concepts that you're describing. But I'm just curious um, if you're familiar with sort of some of the self-compassion practices or literature and, and just generally what you think about that. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's very important. I think a lot of the time uh, people create a distinction or a, kind of a false dichotomy between self-acceptance and self-compassion and, and all these things. And, uh, you know, what I talk about is self-becoming and improvement and, and all this. And they say, you know, stop trying to become, stop trying to be more than you are today. Simply be, simply be at peace with who you are and have compassion. And really, I think it's not an or thing, but an and thing. I think you absolutely need to become aware of yourself and your strengths and your weaknesses and limitations and and uh, and your mistakes in the past you need to accept these things right instead of denying them or pushing them away suppressing them um you know brute force push you know eliminating them because that never works right you should as a starting point for anything accept where you're at and and yeah you should have compassion because there is truly no benefit to blaming yourself for things that you don't have control over. I mean, anything in the past you have zero control over. And even to some extent, you know, where you're at tomorrow, where you're at the next day, you, you only have limited control over these things because you're trying to change uh, the mental software that's been ingrained in you for so long. This is not a quick process. And so, yes, extend that compassion to yourself and that forgiveness and expect uh, that you will make mistakes. But keep your sights on that ultimate end goal, even though you'll never get all the way there. You'll never be the perfect embodiment of everything you admire, right? But but keep your eye on that North Star and try to take a step every day towards it. Um, so so the, the answer is both. You should have compassion and you should try to become more than, than who you are now. And, uh, and it's not always easy to balance those. I talk about like the, the relationship between our emotions and behaviors and our goals and, and uh, it's not easy to really persistently pursue a goal and also have the emotional patience and the equanimity and tranquility when you aren't getting there. You know, um, it, it's not always easy, but it, it can be done. You can uh, have the emotional patience and also the behavioral will to take a step towards that goal uh, and keep pushing for, for what you, um, you know, you want to reach at some point. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, again, everybody, it's Ryan A. Bush. Go get his book or pre-order it. Check out his work. Um, and yeah, just again, Ryan, thank you so much for your time and, and also for your, uh, we, we tried to do this earlier, uh, a month ago or so, and, and I was not as prepared as I would have liked to have been. And your gracious suggestion that we do at another time was thoughtful and <laughs> the right thing to do. And so thank you for, for deciding to do that so that we could have this discussion today. A lot of gratitude to you for that. Thank you. Of course, no problem at all. And and yeah, thanks so much for having me. This is a great conversation. So anytime. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Take it easy. I am very grateful that you watched to the end of this video. Please click one of the boxes to watch more of our content and otherwise have a great day. Peace out.